Hello, this is the second part of your discussion on cardiovascular assessment. This specific section is already focused on history taking and then physical assessment. Please take note of the disclaimer that this is only intended for level 3 students as a uh, supplementary material. This is being augmented by live or synchronous sessions. If there are any questions or concerns regarding this presentation, the email address is indicated on this slide. Now let's talk about the assessment of clients with problems on the cardiovascular function. Let's talk about the patient history. When we are assessing our patient for cardiovascular, just like any other system, we need to have both history and physical assessment to gather both your subjective and objective data respectively. Now on the nursing history, you need to note that men would have higher incidence of coronary artery disease compared to women of all ages, except if the oldest age group of 80 years and older. Then, heart disease is still the leading cause of death among diabetes patients. Also, the death rate is two to four times higher among patients with diabetes. The risk for stroke is also two to four times higher among those patients with diabetes. So, we need to be able to recognize, okay, the symptoms of acute cardiac problems because your acute coronary syndrome and heart failure needs to be managed promptly. Anytime that there will be a delay in assessment and recognition of the particular signs and symptoms might mean the life of your patient. Now let's talk about the common chief complaints that we might encounter for patients with cardiac problems. One is chest pain or discomfort. This may offer array of disorders, angina, ACS, dysrhythmia, valve problem. Okay, whenever you encounter a patient with chest pain or discomfort, you need to ask for the COLDSPA or what we commonly refer to as your cold spa. So you need to check for the character, onset, location, duration, severity, precipitating factors, aggravating factors of this pain experience of your patient. You need to check if the pain is radiating on other areas. You need to ask your patient if he or she can point out the pain with one finger. Okay? You need to be able to assess if he is able to identify the site with one finger. If not, you might suspect that your patient may undergoing myocardial infarction. Because in MI, the tendency of the pain is to be diffused throughout the chest. Then, pain or discomfort in other areas of the body, including arms, back, neck, jaw, or stomach. If there is chest pain with radiation in any of these body parts mentioned, that might indicate that your patient is having acute coronary syndrome. Then shortness of breathing or dyspnea or DOE or dyspnea on exertion. Okay, meaning when your patient is having extra effort or doing some rigorous activities or some activities that require to exert effort, okay, they have the tendency to have shortness of breathing, that is dyspnea on exertion. Why is this important? This may indicate an early symptom of heart failure and maybe the heart symptom that is only experienced by your women. Okay, so if you're encountering women patient complaining of shortness of breathing, dyspnea on exertion, don't just think of cardio problem, you also think of pulmo problem. Then peripheral edema, weight gain and abdominal distension. These are signs of fluid volume excess. These are signs of right-sided heart failure. Okay, right-sided. Remember right-sided? These are systemic signs and symptoms. This may be because of the enlargement of your liver. This could be because of the enlargement of spleen. So whenever there are enlargement of these organs, there's a tendency for the fluid to back flow, okay, or to back out on the venous areas. Then we have palpitations. Your palpitation could be a tachycardia from a variety of causes. Could be acute coronary syndrome, could be caffeine, could be other stimulants, electrolyte imbalances, even valve disease, and then even aneurysm. When I say palpitation, this is described as the feeling of fluttering or unpleasant feeling in the chest because of irregular heartbeat. Okay, your advice for your patient with palpitation is just to remain calm. You don't want them to be to be increasing the oxygen demand of their hearts. 
other than that, if this is a, cane, a known case of angina, and that if your patient would have nitroglycerin tablets, you may administer the nitroglycerin sublingually to manage the palpitations of your patient. Okay? Then we have unusual fatigue, or sometimes referred to as vital exhaustion. In your unusual fatigue, your patient has the tendency to complain he feels very tired, despite the usual activities that he has been doing, like he has been doing this for the, his entire lifetime. But right now, he just feels tired. Okay? This may be again characterized by ACS, heart failure, ventricular heart disease. Okay? So, the patient would have the tendency to be tired and fatigued, irritable and dejected. Next, we have your dizziness, your syncope, or any change in the level of consciousness. Okay? Whenever there is change in the level of consciousness or changes in the LOC, you'll be suspecting shock. Okay, you'll be suspecting that the patient is under um, under your problems such as cerebrovascular disease, dysrhythmia, hypotension, okay, and then vasovagal episode. Remember, when I talk about vasovagal episode, this is your parasympathetic system working. Okay, so your dizziness and your syncope signals that there is a decrease of blood flow towards your brain. There is decreased cerebral blood flow. And with this decrease, you can have your syncopal episode and your dizziness. Now, for the history of present illness, you need to ask these factors. Onset, duration, severity, the course, is it intermittent or continuous? The precipitating factors, the leading factors, associated features, and then previous episodes. Okay, so we need to remember this when we are taking the history of present illness of our during assessment, we need to note of the non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors that our patients may have. So, for example, for the non-modifiable factors, we have your age, we have sex, ethnic background, and family history of cardiovascular disease, which also increases the risk for cardiovascular disease for our patient. Now, we'll have more attention on the modifiable or controllable risk factors because these are risk factors to which we can educate our patient to prevent the further effects of these risk factors. One is your personal habits. So under your personal habits, that may include the use of cigarette. So cigarette use is a major risk factor for CVD. Okay, even your CAD, coronary artery disease, and PVD, which is peripheral vascular disease. There are three components in smoking that have been implicated on your coronary artery disease. One is tar. Tar is a substance with cumulative effect that can be found in smoke from a burning tobacco. Tar. Second, you have your nicotine. Nicotine causes blood vessels to constrict or narrow, which limits the flow of the blood to the different organs. So your nicotine is considered to be a vasoconstrictor. As a vasoconstrictor, it can increase your blood pressure and it can also decrease the blood flow to important organs. Then you have your nicotine also, still on the increase of heart rate, myocardial contractility, and blood pressure. Okay, Your nicotine stimulates your heart rate, contractility, and blood pressure. What happens here is that there will be a simultaneous increase in the oxygen demand and coronary resistance. So imagine all of this will be increased. This could have an increase in your oxygen demand, which can be detrimental to the oxygen balance of your heart. Now, there is physical inactivity and sedentary lifestyle. Physical inactivity is also considered as a major risk factor. So physical activity is expected supposedly to promote cardiovascular fitness. However, if your patient is not having physical activity, you need to watch out for the blood lipids level of your patient and then the clotting factors of your patient, which may be impaired because of inactivity. Then we have obesity. Obesity, sedentary lifestyle, you could have your atherosclerosis okay, or deposit of fatty plaques on the blood vessels of your patient. Then we can have psychological variables. So for your psychological variables, your patient may manifest with stress, anger, anxiety, depression, hostility. Then clients with depression may become less motivated also to have their lifestyle changes and medication regimens. So common signs and symptoms of depression may be feelings of worthlessness, guilt, problems of falling asleep, staying asleep, having little interest or pleasure, difficulty in concentrating, restlessness, and recent changes in appetite or weight. So all of these factors combined may impair also the cardiovascular health of our patients.
past medical history. Looking at the past medical history, the presence of these diseases listed on the slides and the handouts may also influence the cardiovascular status of your patient. Say for example, an increased a history of angina and myocardial infarction would already inform you that your patient is at higher risk of occurrence or recurrence of your angina and myocardial infarction. If your patient would have these disorders or cardiovascular diseases, you might want to know what are the maintenance medications used by your patient. For example, in atrial fibrillation, there is hyperexcitability of your atrium or SA node. The tendency is that your patient are taking blood thinners for clot formation to be prevented. Because in atrial fibrillation, your patient is at risk of clot formation. Okay. Stroke. If there is a stroke, that might imply poor compliance to your atrial fibrillation medication because once there is poor compliance on atrial fibrillation meds, clot may travel towards our cerebral arteries and may have your stroke. Peripheral vascular disease. You might want to ask about smoking in the history of your patient because that's the main risk factor. Hypertension. You might want to ask on compliance on medications. Hyperlipidemia, which is the increase of lipids. So remember, if you're having your lipids, you will be testing for triglycerides, low-density lipoproteins, and then high-density lipoproteins. Take note that your high-density lipoproteins is considered to be the good cholesterol. And then if your patient would have rheumatic fever, you may be able to get from the history that your patient have had sore throat for several times, and then later on they had rheumatic fever. Other medical conditions that you might want is hyperthyroidism. Okay, you might want to explore on is hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism, there will be hyperexcitability of your heart because again, in hyperthyroidism, there is increase of heart rate. Kidney disease, kidney disease may increase your risk for fluid volume excess. Pulmonary disease, it may increase your risk for heart failure resulting from pulmonary problem, which is your core pulmonal, and then your CVA or cerebrovascular accident. Okay, your cerebrovascular accident is commensurate to that of your stroke. Then you have surgical history. So you need to check for the history of bypass graft. You need to check for stents and then valve replacements. Okay, if your patient have been on this surgery, there is a possibility that your patient have been taking maintenance medications also. Also, you might be hearing, hearing murmurs, which are different sounds on the heart because of the placement of the bypass graft or because of the valve replacements. Because for your valve replacement, there may be artificial substances which may be used. Then you need to ask if they have had admission, what is the reason why they have been admitted? Okay, what are the common allergies that they have? And then for the drug history, you need to note of this history or medications that they have been commonly taken. So cardiovascular medications, beta blockers can slow down the heart rate. Calcium channel blockers, you also have your ACE inhibitors. Your ACE inhibitors are used to decrease your blood pressure. Okay, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors are all antihypertensives. Diuretics, which could decrease the fluids of your patient. Okay, meaning it could affect the preload of your patient. Statins, your statins are antihyperlipidemic medications, examples of which is your atorvastatin. Meaning if your patient is taking statins, there is a possibility that your patient have hyperlipidemia or increase of blood cholesterol. Antiplatelets and anticoagulants. You need to ask your patient, why are they taking antiplatelets and anticoagulants? If they are taking antiplatelets and anticoagulants, they are at risk for bleeding. But they might be taking it to prevent clot formation also. As I have mentioned, that is common management for a patient with atrial fibrillation. Then, you check if they're taking contraceptives. Contraceptives increases the risk for thromboembolic disease. In other words, your contraceptives increases the risk for thrombus formation, such as your deep VT or your deep vein thrombosis. And then later on, this thrombus or clotted blood could travel to other parts of the body, making it an embolus. Okay, hence, your contraceptive pills increases the risk for thromboembolic disease. Okay, NSAIDs and aspirin, why are they taking it? Then you have St. John's Wort, for example, which is used for the management of depression. So you need to ask about these substances. Then family history. Review family history and the health status of the family may paint a picture of what's the lifestyle of the family. 
a positive history of coronary artery disease is also a major risk factor. Okay, if first degree relatives, parent, sibling, or child would have CAD, your patient is at high risk of having CAD also. Then social history, what do they have for, what do they usually have for their diet? Are they restricted in fat, sodium, cholesterol, or calories? You also need to ask about the presence of domestic partners, household members, and then environment and occupation. Then, of course, you'll be doing the review of systems. In the review of systems, you'll be asking the particular history okay, and cardiovascular system, which increases the risk of your patient for the next problems. Let's talk about objective data. So your objective data, you're expected to include the baseline data, say, so you need, you need to have the general appearance of your patient. You need to check if your patient is cyanotic or not. You need to check the level of consciousness of your patient. The level of consciousness is an indicator of the oxygenation status of the brain. Okay, so if there is problem on blood perfusion towards the brain, that will be shown okay, in the level of consciousness of your patient. Take note of the level of consciousness. So you have your lethargic, obtunded, stuporous, and coma. Take note that for the brain, irritability or restlessness is the first sign of hypoxia. Okay, then you have your height and weight. Your height and weight could be, could be used to evaluate your BMI. Your weight could also be used to evaluate the fluid status of your patient. Then you have your vital signs. For the physical examination, okay, we will start with inspection. So you need to check again the general appearance and then you need to check for visible pulsations, especially on the apical impulse. Your apical impulse is located on the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. You also need to check for chest configuration, need to check for retractions and the use of accessory muscles for breathing. Okay, so when we are inspecting the chest, we would also want to inspect on these five areas. Okay, so you have your aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, then you have your tricuspid area, and then you have your mitral area. You need to memorize the location of this area. So if I will say aortic area, you're expected to memorize that your aortic area is found on the second ICS of right, okay, right to your sternum. So this is the second intercostal space to the right of your sternum. Then opposite to your aortic area, you have your pulmonic area. Then you have your herbs on the third ICS. You have your tricuspid area, okay, somewhere in the fifth ICS. And then you have your apical pulse or point of maximum impulse found in the midclavicular line of the fifth ICS. Okay? What is the purpose of these areas? When you will be hearing problems okay, in these areas, that would indicate problem on the specific valve or location in the heart. If you would look at this, okay, your aortic valve is located on this part here, the one uh, in circle in red. This is where your aortic valve is located. It says that the aortic area is located here. That simply means that the problems okay, or concerns in your aortic valve could be heard best in this area because that is where the blood from the aorta would first hit. Okay, That is where the blood from the aorta would first hit. For example, pulmonic area. Then you also have your um, tricuspid valve here or tricuspid area. So if you can notice, if you would want to assess for the tricuspid valve, you could not just place your stethoscope directly here. You cannot hear the tricuspid valve properly there because your sternum is located there. Okay, You cannot hear through properly the sternum. So what you're going to do is auscultate on this area, which is your fifth ICS okay, to the left of your sternum. Now, you also need to check for the skin. Okay, so for the skin, you need to check the color. Okay, if there is decreased blood flow, you suspect decreased temperature. That could be seen as decreased temperature. And then your temperature could also be lowered because of heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, and shock. You also need to check for the turgor of your patient, texture, edema, and the presence of apical pulse. So your apical pulse class could be felt through palpation, not only through auscultation. An apical impulse is expected to be present in the fifth ICS again of the left midclavicular line. If the apical pulse is palpated in two distinctly areas and pulsation are paradoxical, 
you may suspect ventricular aneurysm. So you highlight the term ventricular aneurysm. What does it mean? Okay, so you're supposed to palpate it in one area only. But if it can be palpated in two distinct separate areas and they are paradoxical, paradoxical it's not spontaneous or not simultaneous, I mean, you would suspect ventricular aneurysm. Then you have your broad and forceful apical impulse. They may, this may indicate your left ventricular heave or lift because it appears to lift the hand from the chest wall during palpation. Okay, so this may indicate that your heart is exerting additional effort, meaning there is an increase maybe on the afterload. Thrill, when I say thrill, it is a vibration or purring sensation. This could be caused by valvular heart disease, atrial or ventricular septal defect, stenosis, or a large artery such as a carotid artery. Okay, so when I say thrill, okay, there is presence of okay, purring sensation or vibration. Then we go to Percussion. Percussion is less frequently used in the assessment of your heart. Okay, that's why I focus on auscultation. Auscultation is used to evaluate the heart rate, rhythm, cardiac cycle, and valvular function. So your cardiac cycle, again, is composed of your systole and diastole. Then you have your valvular function. So for your heart rate, you need to check on the rhythm, the presence of murmurs, extrasystolic sounds, and then presence of rubs. Let's briefly talk about the normal heart sound. So your normal heart sound is composed of S1, S2, lub dub. So for your S1, your S1 is considered to be the first heart sound. It marks the onset of systole. Okay, remember, it is best heard at the apex of the heart. So your lub could be best heard on the apex of the heart. Notice that the location of your apex is found on the lower part of your heart. Okay, so that's your lab. It results from the closure of your AV valve. Again, it results from the closure of your AV valve. The intensity increases with tachycardia and mitral stenosis. Occurs, the accentuated S1 occurs as AV valves close with greater force than normal. If there is a decrease in your S1 sound or your lab sound, it could be caused by your mitral regurgitation and heart failure. Okay, so why are we listening on your lab on the apex? Take note that once the blood will pass through your atrioventricular valves, okay, the tendency of the blood is to go towards your ventricular walls. That's why it's best to listen for your AV valve assessment through your ventricular walls because that's where the blood would directly, would directly go through. Okay, so again, S1 marks the onset of systole. Then for your S2, S2 dub, it is characteristically shorter. It marks the onset of diastole and the closure of your semilunar valve. Okay, so your S2 could be best heard at the base of the heart. So when I talk about base of the heart, the base of the heart is located here. Okay, we will be focusing here. Because if you would look at the anatomy, once the blood will go out of the pulmonic artery, which is your semilunar valve, and once the blood will go out of your aortic valve, the direction of the blood is going towards the upper surface of the heart. That's why it's best to assess your S2 sound on the base of the heart. So it is best heard also over the pulmonic area if we're talking about the normal physiologic splitting of S2. So in your S2, there could be that normal physiologic splitting. This normal physiologic splitting occurs when the closure between the pulmonic and the aortic are distinguishable and accentuated on inspiration, but this appears on expiration. Okay, so this is best heard on your pulmonic area. This may be considered normal again. Then you have your abnormal heart sounds. Your abnormal heart sounds could be one, abnormal splitting of the S2. So your abnormal splitting of the S2 or paradoxical splitting of your S2 can be heard among patients with myocardial depression. It is also present among patients with myocardial infarction, left BBB or your left bundle branch black, aortic stenosis, aortic regurge, and then right ventricular pacing. Then gallop and murmurs. These are common abnormal sounds that may occur with heart disease, but they can occur also in some healthy people. Then you have your S3 and your S4. 
your S3 is referred to as the ventricular gallop. On the other hand, your S4 is referred to as atrial gallop. You need to remember that your S3 lap the dub, the last dub there. The norm, it may be a normal finding among children and adults up to 35 to 40 years old because this is referred to as your physiologic S3. However, beyond that age, your S3 sound may indicate heart failure. Right-sided S3 is heard over the tricuspid area and then the left-sided S3 is best heard over your apical area. Then for your S4, your atrial gallop, it could be caused by several conditions, like right? such as your ventricular hypertrophy. Right-sided S4 is also best heard over the tricuspid area with the client in supine position. Then you have the term, okay? You need to note, I mean, of the causes of abnormal sounds. So you take note of the causes of your abnormal sounds. So causes of abnormal sounds may include increase in the rate or velocity of blood flow, okay, forward or backward flow of incompetent valve, then flow into a dilated chamber, then flow through an abnormal passage between the heart chambers. So note, notice that if there are structural problems within your heart, may that be because of the blood flow, may that be because of your incompetent valve, it would manifest as abnormal sounds. For that reason, you can notice that most of our physicians would use stethoscopes, which are advanced and can detect the presence of these sounds. And then it would take an experienced clinician for you to recognize these sounds. Murmurs. So when I talk about murmurs, your murmurs reflect turbulent blood flow through normal or abnormal valve. The quality of murmurs can be characterized, which could be harsh, blowing, whistling, rumbling, or squeaking. So they are usually described by pitch, which could be usually high or low. Then, we have the presence of your pericardial friction drop. In the lungs, we have discussed your pleural friction drop. So here we have the term pericardial friction drop. So your pericardial friction rub is, of course, from your pericardium. It could be a result of, okay, it may be transient if it is a sign of inflammation, infection, infiltration. It can be heard among your patients with pericarditis, meaning inflammation of your pericardium, which can be because of your MI, among your patient with cardiac tamponade. So when we say cardiac tamponade, there is abnormal presence of fluid in the pericardial space and then post thoracotomy after a chest tube is inserted to your patient. So this is where you will be hearing your pericardial friction rub. Okay, it is uh, loudest on the left sternal border. Diagnostic examinations. So you have the imaging studies, you have your chest x-ray, you have your echo echocardiogram, and then you have your magnetic resonance imaging. So for your chest x-ray, your chest x-ray can be used to visualize the heart. It could help you determine the size, the contour, the position of the heart. Okay? It may help us identify some physiologic alterations. It can also help us identify ventricular hypertrophy or enlargement of some of the chambers of the heart. It can also confirm for the presence of pacemaker and pulmonary catheters. This purpose of your chest x-ray. Then you have your echocardiogram. When you think of your echocardiogram, just think of your ultrasound for the heart. So that's your 2D echo, your echocardiogram. So your echocardiogram would involve the use of high-frequency sound waves into the heart through the chest wall. It is used to measure your ejection fraction. So when I say ejection fraction, it is the percentage of the blood that goes out of your heart every time it pumps. You can also check the size, the shape, and motion of the heart. If you can notice the image on the screen of the physician, you can see that there is blue and red colors there which could indicate the arterial blood flow and then the venous blood flow. It is used also to evaluate pericardial effusion, presence of fluids in the pericardial space. Also used to evaluate further your murmur because your murmur is oftentimes caused by regurgitation. So if there is presence of regurgitation, it can be detected if by how many percent is the regurgitation through observation through the to the echo. Then you also have your valvular heart disease. If you can notice, if you have patients with rheumatic heart fever, they would usually have their routine to the echo. Okay, the purpose of this is to evaluate the progression of the valve disease or to evaluate the response of the patient to treatment. Then MRI. We've encountered MRI several times, so MRI could do your 3D imaging. 
So your MRI could give us a detailed image of the heart. So you can have your cardiac wall thickness, chamber dilation, valve and ventricular function, and then blood movement through the great vessels. So your great vessels, your SVC, IVC, and then your aorta. Then we have your ECG. Your ECG is able to display the electrical activity of the heart through the analysis of your ECG platform. So you have there the specific parts of your ECG. You have your P wave, you have your QRS complex, you have your T wave, and then your ST segment. If you would look at the illustration on the lower right hand of the screen, so this is your P wave. This will be your QRS wave. Then you have your T wave. Okay, so these are the components of your ECG. Now, the appearance of your ECG would vary depending on the leads and the location of the leads on your patient's body. Now, your P wave. The P wave is said to represent depolarization of your atria. So take note, atrial depolarization. The, the peak of the wave here indicates that your SA node is already firing an electrical signal. Your QRS complex indicates that the electrical signal has already reached your ventricular or your ventricles. Hence, it's referred to as your ventricular depolarization. And then after that, it would proceed to your ventricular repolarization. So your D wave is the one that represents your ventricular repolarization. Okay? Your ST segment is an indication that there is an early ventricular repolarization. So your ST segment is somewhere here since this is your S and this is your T wave. So that is your ST segment. So you also have the terms PR interval and then your QR or your QT interval. So your PR interval is the distance, of course, between the first uh, elevation here for your P wave and then the start of your R wave. That's why it's referred to as your PR interval. Then you also have your QT interval. So for your QT interval, that will be between your Q wave and then the end of your T wave. Okay, referred to as your QT interval. Now, for your ST segment, okay, your ST segment is among the particular signs for your um, myocardial infarction. So for your ST segment, ST segment depression may identify the presence of myocardial ischemia or injury. Okay, ischemia or injury. On the other hand, when I say ST segment elevation, you have your evidence for an evolving myocardial infarction. Okay, that's why we have the term STEMI. The term STEMI is ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. We oftentimes refer to this one as the classic chair appearance of an ECG of a patient with myocardial infarction. Because if a normal ECG would look like this one in lead to Okay, like the PQRST that we have illustrated on the previous slide, for your patient with MI, especially ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction, it would appear to be like this one. Okay, there is an elevation of your ST segment. Okay, if you would look at it, this elevation of ST segment could manifest as a chair-like appearance. That's why they refer to that one as chair-like appearance on the ECG, which is a classic sign of your myocardial infarction. Okay? Now, we also have your leads. Let's talk about the leads. So this is a basic 12-lead ECG. For a 12-lead ECG, your six limb leads are used to view the heart in frontal or vertical planes. Okay, you have the frontal and vertical planes. When I say six leads or six limb leads, this can be found here on the RA, LA, LL, and RL. Okay, right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. You might be wondering how come it's six. Now for this one, there is what you call a plane there, okay, which would have your positive and negative charges. It would have six leads because it would your ECG will be reading the firing from the left to right, also from right to left, from left arm to left leg, and then left leg to left arm, from left leg to right arm, right arm to left leg. Hence, hence you will have six leads there. Okay, you might be wondering what is the purpose of the right leg there. The right leg limb would not have a charge. They commonly refer to that one as a ground. Okay, it's just a ground. So it's not used, it doesn't have charges. Okay. Now, the other six leads are referred to as precordial leads. The precordial leads are your V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Okay, look at the location of your V1. It's placed on the right side. 
okay, on the right side of your sternum. Opposite to that is your V2. Then just below your V2, you have your V3. We are placing the V5 at the point of maximum impulse. So between V5, you'll be placing V3, uh, V4. And then you have V6 here. Okay. Also, one thing for you to memorize is the location pala of your limbed leads. So take note, we usually memorize this as smoke over fire. That means black over red here. And then snow on top of trees. Okay, so that is smoke over fire and then snow on top of trees. Okay, for us to know what is to be placed on the left arm, left leg, right arm, and right leg. The modern ECG machines that you would have in the hospital right now could already have the labels if it is right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. However, it is a common item still in the board exam to come out. Okay, so try to familiarize yourselves with that. It may place this way. It may also place this way. Okay, we usually place this one if you're attaching electrodes. We use this one if you're using the clips. Okay, if you're using the clips. We also have your 15 lead ECG. So for your 15 lead ECG, there are three additional chest leads which are, which are used for early diagnosis of right ventricular and left posterior ventricular infarction. In clinical practice, we usually use your 15 lead ECG we usually use your 15 lead ECG in evaluation of pediatric cardiac functioning. So if you can notice, we are placing additional leads here. Okay, that will be your V7, V8, and your V9. In practice, before we take your 15 lead ECG, we will do first your 12 lead ECG, and then we'll transfer some of the electrodes going towards the other side. Okay, that will be the right side now, and then it will be recorded at V7, V8, and V9. So as you can notice, the additional electrodes are found on the right side. Then you have your 18 leads ECG. So for your 18 leads ECG, um, what we have is that there will be additional of three posterior leads. Okay, Other than the three that we have added for your 15 leads, there will be three posterior leads. It is helpful for detection, again, of myocardial ischemia, injury, and the origin of arrhythmia. So if you want to be very specific on what part of the heart is injured, you can do your 18 leads ECG. Okay, so these are some of the ECG changes that you might have recalled in our discussion in fluids and electrolytes. So for example, there is prolongation of your QT interval, which is typical for hypocalcemia. For your hyperkalemia, you can see prolonged PR interval, ST segment depression, widening of your QRS, and then loss of your Hypokalemia, ST segment depression, flattened T wave, and then you will have your presence of U wave. If you can recall in PQRST, we are not talking about U wave, but in hypokalemia, there is an additional U wave there. Okay, then we have your phonocardiography. Your phonocardiography is the recording of audible vibrations coming from the heart and the great vessels. You refer to that one as phonocardiography. Phono, okay, phono is your vibrations. So right now there are stethoscopes which could record your, uh, which could record also the audible vibrations. Other than that, there are also uh, to the echo which are also capable already of carrying out your phonocardiography. Okay, so it can obtained either with a chest microphone or a miniature sensor. The phonocardiogram usually supplements the information brought about by your stethoscope, and it is of special diagnostic value when performed simultaneously with the measurement of the electrical properties of your heart. By the way, if you have a patient with arrhythmia, okay, if you have a patient with arrhythmia, one standard treatment or management for a patient with arrhythmia, management I mean, okay, is to have them on continuous ECG monitoring. So that's why we'd have this patient attached to cardiac monitors because we would want to monitor if ever there is progression of the arrhythmia and we don't want our patient to progress towards myocardial infarction. Now let's talk about stress test. Your stress test is tool used for detecting and evaluation of your CAD. So it's referred to as a treadmill stress test because what you do is you ask your patient to walk there. Well, the speed here of the, uh, the treadmill is being increased until your patient will be able to tolerate. If you can notice, your patient is attached to electrodes because it is being monitored if what will be the effect of stress, quote-unquote, okay, to your patient's cardiac rhythm. Also, your patient will be on continuous BP monitoring. 
Once your patient could not tolerate the procedure, you need to stop the procedure. You do not force your patient to end this procedure. That's why if you would look at your handouts, okay, it helps use using, involves using, I mean, controlled and carefully supervised exercise to increase the myocardial oxygen demand. And later on, it would evaluate the effect of your oxygen demand to your heart's rhythm. It is helped to determine or used to determine presence of CAD, okay, to identify the cause of chest pain, functional capacity of the heart for surgery, after a surgery, I mean, effectiveness of your medications that the patient is taking, currents of dysrhythmias, and then physical fitness program planning. However, you are not supposed to expose your patient to stress tests if your patient would have acute MI that would aggravate your patient's condition. If there is unstable angina, meaning angina or chest pain that we cannot predict, uncontrolled dysrhythmia with hemodynamic compromise, meaning there is a dysrhythmia, a cardiac problem, cardiac electrical problem, wherein the heart's hemodynamics is already compromised, meaning vital sign of normalities. Okay? Severe aortic stenosis, there is narrowing of your aorta, acute myocarditis or pericarditis, and then decompensated heart failure, meaning heart failure which is not being compensated by the coping mechanisms of your heart. If your patient would have these conditions, we do not allow your patient to go on with stress test. That's how important your vital signs is before you take your patient to your stress test room. Now, you need to remember that you have preparation prior to stress test. One of the major preparation perhaps is to instruct your patient to be on jogging attire. They need to be in their comfortable uh, clothing for them to go on with your uh, stress test. We often advise our patients to wear tennis shoes and then comfortable clothing for exercise purposes. Then you have your Holter monitoring. When I talk about your Holter monitoring, it says continuous ambulatory monitoring. This is done among patients with, um, uh, with angina to determine which dysrhythmia may be causing clinical signs and symptoms that may not occur during a routine ECG. Take note, your routine ECG could be done in just matters of minutes, two to five minutes maybe. Now, your Holter monitor may be able to detect ECG changes that your patient experienced throughout the day during a usual workday. What happens is that they're wearing an electrode and then the electrode is attached to the Holter monitor. This Holter monitor may be connected now wirelessly to the base station or the base nurse's station or heart station to monitor for the presence of arrhythmia. Other than this, your patient may be asked to make a diary or a diary of activities that was done during the day in such a way that the doctor will be able to identify the presence or trigger for the abnormal dysrhythmias that occur during the Holter monitoring. Let's say, for example, at 10 a.m., it was noted that the patient had an increase in the heart rate and then the patient had signs of ST elevation. So the patient needs to note what happened during this time. Okay? In that way, the doctor will be able to identify the triggers of arrhythmia. Let us review the laboratory test that can be used to evaluate or diagnose your patients with cardiovascular disorders. Also, these laboratory tests could be used to screen for the risk factors, especially those associated with coronary artery disease. Okay, so they may also help to establish your baseline values. Let's start with your lipid profile. When I talk about lipid profile, the three things that we usually measure in your lipid profile are your triglycerides, your low-density lipoproteins, and your high-density lipoproteins. You need to note that your high-density lipoproteins are considered to be good cholesterol. Okay? They are measured to evaluate the risk for CAD or coronary artery disease, especially for those with family history of cardiac problems. Then we have your serum electrolytes. So you add sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Let's review the normal values of these electrolytes. Cardiac enzymes. So for your cardiac enzymes, also sometimes referred to as cardiac biomarkers, they are referred to as cardiac biomarkers because their increase is specific to damage to the cardiac muscle. Okay, let's go over them one by one. You have your troponin. So there are two troponins. You have your troponin T and your troponin I. In the clinical setting, what's more commonly used is your troponin I. It is a myocardial protein that is released into the bloodstream with the injury of your myocardial muscle. So every time troponin I or T is released in our bloodstream, it means that there is injury to our cardiac muscle. Okay? They are not found in healthy patients. So any rise would indicate cardiac necrosis or acute MI. Take note of the normal values. It should be less than 
0.03 nanogram per ml and less than 0.20 nanogram per ml for your troponin I and T respectively. Then let's go to your creatinine kinase. There are three kinds of creatinine kinase. Okay, you have your CKMM, you have your CKMB, and then you have your CKBB. For this reason, it is not usually, okay, when we talk about creatinine kinase, it's difficult to determine if it is specific to the heart problem. However, take note that among the three, it is your CKMB that is found in your myocardial muscle. MM is for skeletal muscles, BB is for your brain. Okay, take note of the normal values indicated in your handouts. For CKMB, its activity is most specific for MI and shows a predictable rise and fall during three days. And the peak levels occurs about 24 hours after the onset of chest pain. Okay, so if you notice that the peak levels or the CKMB levels are peaking, that would mean that your patient already had 24 hours of myocardial damage. Then another Another early marker for MI is your myoglobin. It is a low molecular weight protein found in the cardiac and skeletal muscle. But take note of the term skeletal muscle. So an increase in your myoglobin may also be indicative of skeletal muscle damage and not only your cardiac muscle damage. Then we have your ABG or your arterial blood gas. For your arterial blood gas, the determination are often obtained in patients with cardiovascular disease, essential to appropriate intervention and treatment. So remember, your arterial blood gas would measure your pH, pacO 2 and HCO3. We know that acidosis could affect our heart, so as alkalosis. Also, your ABG talks about perfusion. Okay, it talks about how adequately perfused our body organs are. Hence, your ABG could also evaluate your cardiac functioning. Then you have your WBC. WBC or your leukocyte, white blood cell. We know white blood cell is increased in infectious and inflammatory diseases. Later on, you will see that there are a lot of inflammatory diseases also for your cardiac muscle. Then you have your erythro erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is an indication of inflammation. BNP, your brain natriuretic peptide or B-type natriuretic peptide is a neurohormone that regulates your BP and fluid volume. We've touched on this in fluids and electrolytes. Now, for cardiac, your BNP levels are useful for prompt diagnosis of your heart failure. Your BNP, in fact, can be used to differentiate if the signs and symptoms of your patient are brought about by the problems of the heart or brought about by respiratory problems. Okay, so your BNP is good for the diagnosis of your brain, not your, uh, of your heart failure, I mean. So again, elevated BNP may also occur in pulmonary embolus, your myocardial infarction, and ventricular hypertrophy. Now, let's talk about thallium scanning. Thallium scanning is thallium. When I say thallium, your thallium is a radioactive substance. And the purpose of this is this substance is injected into the bloodstream to make an image of the blood flow to the heart. So this is talking about blood flow to your heart. Then we have your cardiac catheterization. Your cardiac catheterization, as the term implies catheterization, meaning a catheter is inserted going towards your heart. It may have several purposes. It may be used for diagnostic purposes, especially for hemodynamic monitoring if you would want to monitor the specific pressures on the heart of your patient. Your cardiac catheterization could also be used if you want to do your coronary angiography. Meaning, if I want to map the blood vessels of the heart to find out if there are any blockage okay, or blockage in any part of the blood vessels. So, your cardiac catheterization is considered to be an invasive procedure. Looking at it, you will know, looking at the picture, one of the insertion sites commonly used is your femoral artery. Since we are using your femoral artery, one of your nursing interventions that you need to make sure prior to this procedure is the bleeding parameters of your patient. Okay, including your prothrombin time, APTT, your INR, your clotting time, bleeding time. Should be assessed for the risk for bleeding of your patient. After the procedure, this site should be applied with pressure. Okay, we apply pressure to prevent bleeding because remember, this is an artery. Okay, so it is most definitive but also the most invasive procedure. It may also include studies of the right or left side of your heart and the coronary arteries. It may also include evaluation of your pulmonary arteries and your pulmonary vein. Then, we have your 
cardiac, still on cardiac catheterization. So your cardiac catheterization could also locate stenos or obstructed blood vessels. It could also measure the pressure and oxygen level in the heart. Um, then you have your checking on the heart valves and checking the pumping action of your heart. So, as mentioned, a catheter is inserted through your femoral artery going towards your aorta, going towards your heart. Then we have coronary angiography. As I have mentioned, your coronary angiography is done through your coronary or cardiac catheterization. In coronary angiography, a contrast media is being inserted to your patient and the patient may be subjected to fluoroscopy, meaning continuous x-ray images, or the patient may be subjected to um, CT scan okay, in such a way that we will be able to map the blood vessels of the patient. Okay? Since contrast media here will be inserted to your patient, will be given to your patient, one thing that you need to assess again is the creatinine levels of your patient. And after the procedure, okay, unless if there are contraindications, you again need to increase the oral fluid intake of your patient. Okay, your coronary angiography, another procedure perhaps that is uh, curative, is your coronary angioplasty. In your coronary angioplasty, okay, uh, what's being placed is a, a stenting could be placed to reperfuse the blood vessels that have been obstructed. Okay, we'll have more on that on your myocardial infarction. Okay, so this is coronary angiography. As you can see, the images shows okay, the contrast uh, media. Okay, it clearly shows what part of the blood vessels are stenos or obstructed. Then you have coronary angioscopy. This allows direct visualization of the internal surfaces of your blood vessels. Then you have hemodynamic monitoring. We've touched hemodynamic monitoring along the way. So when I say hemodynamic monitoring, these are invasive procedures of monitoring the pressure in our body, specifically in your heart. So you have your central venous pressure, you have your PAP monitoring, then you have your intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring. Let's talk about CVP. CVP, we've discussed this in fluids and electrolytes. So your CVP measures your pressure at the vena cava and the right atrium. Central venous, that's why it's referred to as central venous because your vena cava, take note, is your major vein. Now, the normal CVP is playing at 2 to 6 millimeter mercury. If it's greater than 6, hypervolemia. If it's less than 6, you would suspect that your patient has hypovolemia. It could be bleeding, could be dehydration, could be dehydration secondary to vomiting or diarrhea. Then you have your pulmonary artery pressure monitoring. As the term implies, pulmonary artery. So, if you are measuring the pulmonary artery, okay, this is critical to assess your left ventricular function, diagnose etiology of your shock, evaluate the patient's response to medical interventions. Then you have your intra-arterial BP monitoring. As the term implies, intra-arterial BP monitoring. This is contrasted to what we usually do in the clinical area, which is your NIBP. NIBP is a non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. For this time, intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring, meaning it is inserted or the pressure is monitored through your arteries. A probe is inserted towards your arteries and the probe is attached to a catheter going towards the cardiac monitor, wherein your blood pressure inside your body could be red. Of course, it's more accurate compared to the non-invasive blood pressure monitoring that we do but since this is an, an invasive procedure, you cannot usually see this in the uh, medical surgical ward setting. These are usually seen among patients who are admitted in intensive care unit. Here are some of the nursing diagnoses common to our patients with cardiac problem. You can have your ineffective cardiac tissue perfusion. You also have your ineffective peripheral tissue perfusion. Then you have your decreased cardiac output, activity intolerance, excessive fluid volume, the risk for impaired gas exchange, deficient knowledge, and then anxiety or fear. Okay? We'll be discussing the nursing diagnosis as we go along the specific disorders. Also have acute pain, risk for impaired skin integrity, and risk for infection. Maybe related to your hemodynamic monitoring. Okay? Thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Rubiana Gesto for the outline and graphics of these slides.